So, when I say ancient Egypt, what comes to mind? Well, first thing you probably thought of were pharaohs, right? Pyramids, yada yada. Well, this, that stint of Egypt's history is, co covers the time of 3000 to 332 BC. In the end, they were overtaken by the Persian Empire, and eventually Alexander the Great swooped on through this shuffle the culture along to the classical antiquity, and that continues down to semi-familiar territory. But what about before ancient Egypt? No. Let's start way, way back in the past. An ice age was at its peak roughly 30,000 years ago. Huge, huge glacial mountains covered Ethiopia, Kenya, and Uganda. Now, being near the equator, it was um, a pretty okay spot for humans to try and weather through the cold. Unfortunately, 12,000 years ago, the, this, that was when the glaciers started to melt, and it led to almost endless floods, washes, and so forth, and these were particularly rough on the northern face of this mountain. Now, this went onward into the Nile River. Primitive structures that were in the area built by humans at the time, they couldn't stand a chance from these floods. I mean, you had sediment also pouring in with this, and it was just covering everything. Humanity as a whole had to back away while this event went on, and this whole ongoing issue with the, the Nile just flooding like crazy was called the Wild Nile. Now, people in the area were used to a much more calm Nile flow, but now it was incredibly inhospitable. Moving away from the river, however, wasn't an option for humans in the area. Thing is, um, the Ice Age ended, and, well, didn't technically end, because we're still in Ice Age right now, technically, but anyways, the precipitation had started picking up heavily on the eastern coast of Africa, near the coast. Now, Along the Nile, the monsoon belt, typically associated with the area, actually crept northward as the weather changed, meaning that this whole region as a whole got almost no precipitation of any sort. It was just absolutely, completely, 100% bone dry if you got away from the river. The thing is, the river itself was such a mess that you couldn't settle anywhere near it. Now. How's about a little bit of hydrology, all right? Well, picture this. The Nile is restored by glacial melt, right? But the grain sorting and erosion near the upper Nile is rather crazy. Between uh, an explosion of plant growth, a higher tree line, higher temperatures, and more resistance to colder weather, this stretch of the river got pounded and caked by sediment, and it held onto it. Now, the water, however, it had to go somewhere. It was a lot of water, and as it went northward toward the lower Nile, however, there was uh, there was very little sediment actually remaining in the flow. Now this caused something referred to as downcutting, meaning that the current dug a sharp canal, so to speak. In a case where more sediment existed, it would have been more of a sloping surface and very wide or broad, but this could be envisioned as almost like taking a high-pressure hose and shooting it up against a mound of loose sand. As opposed to a gentle riverbed, you have a sharp path for the water, meaning that it was incredibly susceptible to flooding. To make the danger of flooding even worse, heavily downcut rivers have a much stronger and faster current. Getting caught in it was very dangerous, and crossing it was no laughing matter. Also, riverbeds fitting these traits had very high levels of lateral erosion, which basically refers to the river eating away at the shores and expanding itself. Now, between this and flooding, settlements near the banks, um, they weren't a good idea. Agriculture was also a very risky proposition between the weather and just, you know, what you could call agricultural technology at the time. As a brief aside, the nature of the Nile is kind of confusing to me at this point, honestly. I mean, there's mention of the downcutting and a strong current, but we're, you know, we're hardly at a super high elevation sort of location. What I mean is, 
The Nile, for the most part, it flows through lowland terrain, meaning that the downcutting would hit its base level easily. In cases like this, bodies of water and downcutting are wider and calmer by nature. A super crazy V-shaped gouge would be more characteristic of higher elevation or mountainous settings. And I just kind of find it strange that they mention everything mentions this current being so crazy, but it doesn't really fit what I usually read about in downcutting. But maybe the large amount of wash made this a special case. I, I'm not sure, but um, I'm kind of getting off track. The back back on the topic, the Nile's banks were inhospitable meaning that in order to get away from the flooding, settlers in the area had to move outward into the desert, which wasn't exactly chock full of sunshine and gumdrops. Basically, they were boned. Across this stretch, in fact, there were at least four or five groups of people that just fizzled out. I mean, you had the Afian, the Isnan, the Kadan, the Sibelian, to name just a few. And in the upper Egypt area, large stores of smoked and preserved fish were found near where the Nile was less susceptible to the crazy flooding, but elsewhere, further out into the desert and such, large graves, damaged bones, and many weapons were found, seeming to indicate that food grew scarce and people probably turned to violence in order to survive. Needless to say, it, uh, it really wasn't a fun time or place to be alive. People in the area faded away and went off to search for greener pastures, quite literally, in fact. Aside from uh, a few minor settlements, this area was almost inhospitable from 10,000 BC to 6,000 BC. There was like literally 4,000 years where you could not find anyone around here just due to how harsh of an environment it was. Now, right around 6,000 BC, all of a sudden, People start popping up all over the place, possibly due to rainfall normalizing, maybe. Now, a sudden influx of agricultural goods and techniques seems to indicate that people migrated either from the Levant or further to the northeast, from the Fertile Crescent. Interestingly enough, the innovations in various ways of life found within these civilizations seems to hint that they didn't all come from one place. You know, possibly they were like from a melting pot background of sorts. Eventually, two major settlements formed, one near the Nile Delta and the other in Upper Egypt, near modern-day Kina. As time passed, civilizations overlapped, and you kind of ended up with an Upper and Lower Nile pair of civilizations. Now, these civilizations kind of sprinkled all over the area, and chief among them at first were the Fayum, the Badarians and the Tazians. Finally, right around 4400 BC, at the tail end of these uh, civilizations, we reach a trio of cultures. However, it's probably more, probably more accurate to say that these are three different settlement sites from the same culture. Now, this a lot of people say that this is actually the evolution of the same culture, and they just named them based upon the sites they were find, found at. Now, the first of these three is known as the Amration culture, and it stands out due to a feature in its pottery. And up to this point, blacktop pottery was common. However, the Amrations began developing pottery with slightly different patterns and colors and materials, and Due to trace minerals found in some of these, it's theorized that they have, must have undergone some extensive trade with Nubia, Sinai, and other regions. By 3500 BC, they were replaced by the Gerzean culture. Pottery from these guys eventually grew far more sophisticated, and once met with drought along the Nile, the Gerzans actually fell back on agriculture almost exclusively and actually flourished. Although the Gerzans were still Amration at their core, they also exhibited a lot of influence from Mesopotamians, as evidenced in various tools, relief work, and pottery. Now finally, by 3200 BC, we arrive at Dynasty Zero, which is known as Nakada III. The Amration and Gerzean cultures are labeled by some as Nakada I, 
and Nakata II, respectively, since they were preceding phases of the same culture. Nakata III is seen as the proto-dynastic era, as it is set in motion what would eventually become the Egyptian culture and the ongoing Egyptian dynasties. Now, what, why, what was so important about Nakata III? Well, firstly, hieroglyphics were established and adopted by society. In addition to this, political structures began to form and take hold within the now unified countryside. Plus, Nakata III made use of sail navigation and practiced regular burial rituals for their royalty. And speaking of royalty, they began using sereks, which were insignias of sorts to indicate status. Think of it as a symbol of the pharaoh, essentially. As for the two civilizations I mentioned earlier on the Delta and Upper Egypt, it's believed that these lower and upper sections of Egypt were unified, and that unification is what brought the end of the proto-dynastic era. It is actually believed they were uni unified by someone named Narmer, who was the final ruler of the proto-dynastic era, and by proxy, the first ruler of ancient Egypt proper. But that said, there's some debate over this. Narmer's relief is associated with artwork commemorating the unification of Egypt, but there is a, some discussion as to whether his predecessor, Ka, was responsible and Narmer rode on his coattails. Alternatively, people wonder if Narmer's contributions bore fruit after his death, hence all the things commemorating him. Now, another theory is that he lived and went onward and he he was served as a pharaoh who's known in some places as Menes, but you know there's some historians who think that this early pharaoh known as Menes was actually Hor Aha, Narmer's son, but the unfortunate thing is, from how long ago this was, it's just, there's a lot of uncertainty and certain details, and some things are just, you know, ultimately lost to time. And unfortunately, at this point, there are just, some things about it we'll likely never know.